Praise God, praise God. Last week, the Lord dropped into my spirit as I thought about my life living, you know, pretty much for myself most of my life. And then one day, I find Jesus. I yield to that. And from that day forward, some 29, almost 29 years ago to next month, I've been serving the Lord. And uh, the Lord talked, about, to, talked to me about how everybody that serves God needs to understand the formula for successful service to God. We know that everything we have comes back to the cross of Christ. What he did on that cross, that's, that's faith in that is what obtains whatever it is that we need. But he dropped three words into my spirit that day and I began to think about how they, these three things work in unison. Like, like, like a, I hate to use the word formula, but I can't come up with a better word for it right now, but it's like a formula for understanding how to serve Christ. He said, prayer, faith, spirit. Then he told me, he said, faith, excuse me, prayer communicates, faith accepts, and the spirit does. And I, and I pondered on that, and I thought on that, and I thought on that, and I thought on that. And I got my word out and I began to search the scriptures. And I was amazed at how this formula is scripturally so sound. We have to communicate. I mean, the very essence of salvation begins with us calling out to God. Petitioning, communicating with God. Okay, God, I'm a sinner. I've been a sinner all my life. I've been a rural jerk or whatever the case might be. I call on you. I don't understand this salvation thing, but I call on you. I want you, Jesus. Amen. Starts with prayer. But then the Bible tells us how to get saved, to confess our sins, and to believe in our heart. They start out, I couldn't have set my sermon up better than with any other song. Talking about believing. The word believe, and I probably mispronounce the Greek word. I do that a lot. But the Greek word is pistio. And it truly means an assurance of a truth. When we believe, we're assured of the truth to who Jesus Christ is and what he did on that cross. And that by faith in that, we have salvation. But now once you petition God, you accept and you, 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 you think about this. Well, let me back up and say it right. You've called out to God. You communicated. You've now believed. But you can't do this on your own. 44 years of my life, I did it my way. I thought, well, how do I, how do I, how do I live this life? Because I, I grew up in church. I grew up uh, with a godly mother. And I grew up around godly people in a Pentecostal church. I can talk a little bit about a, go, a while ago about we had to open the windows. We didn't have no ceiling fans. We'd open them windows up and pray for breeze to come through. And that was church. Preacher would get up there and he'd, he'd have his jacket on that suit and tie. He ain't never preached without that jacket and tie. He'd have a ring of sweat from his elbow all the way to the middle of his chest on each side. It's hot in there. What's that got to do with anything, Brother Mullen? I don't know. I just think it shows what real faith is all about. So I grew up in that. I grew up in that environment. And I remember the men specifically and the women. My mother was part of the 
doings of the church. She was a worker in the church, always doing something. Taught Sunday school. She taught, uh, kept the nursery. She involved in whatever the church was doing, she was involved in. Doors were open, she was there. And I admired her. I admired her probably more than just about any human being I know. For the person she was, the things she went through, and how she never faltered in her faith. And so when I grew up in that, I thought, I want to live like that. I, I want to be like these people in this church. But I don't know how. Because I get saved on Sunday. And on Monday, in my mind, I had no concept of what grace was, justification by faith. I didn't really understand. I knew that Christ died on the cross for my sins. But I didn't know enough about the Word or know enough about the Lord to know that, you know, I was not going to be perfect like I thought all these people were. I'm sure my mom had her fault as well. I didn't know about the power. You see, you can't serve Christ without the power. You're not strong enough. The Bible tells us very clearly that, you know, there's no good thing in this flesh. So when you activate the petition to get saved, and you call on the name of the Lord, then you, then you need faith to believe, because you can pray the prayer all day long if you don't really believe. You can confess every sin you ever committed, but if you don't believe, then you're not saved. But once you believe, the moment you believe, the Holy Ghost sets up residence. He moves in. He starts coming in and he begins to rearrange some things in you. He begins to do some things in your heart. He, he immediately sets up that residence within you. And now you have the power. Woo, glory to God. You have the power to live a godly life. Now the Lord's showed me this and I prayed on uh, excuse me I preached on prayer last week and how prayer and faith are, are unified but I began to realize that this just does not take place just with salvation because once you get saved once you have believed once you're really and truly and I understand justification by faith now better than I ever have before believe me I do but I still need that power. I still need this petitioning ability. Communication. If you married couples never communicated, your marriage would eventually deteriorate. It would be totally destroyed. As a matter of fact, that's the problem with a lot of marriages today. There's no communication. And so our communication with God is essential. And our a consistent, maintained faith in who Jesus is and what he did on that cross must be maintained. You don't just believe it for salvation. The Bible says that we're sanctified, which means basically means to be set apart for. We're set apart for what? We're set apart for salvation. We're of the salvation class. But the, the sanctification does not stop there because the power continues within you to live a godly life. And as you can look back on your Christian walk now. 20 years ago, you were doing things that uh, you wouldn't think of doing today. Why? Because the sanctification process continues in you by faith in what Christ did, continues in you, and God provides the power going along with that faith. When you have faith, the power comes to live as God would have you to live. So this little idea of prayer, faith, and, and power go hand in hand with everything in this Word. That's how we live a godly life. That's how we, over, we become overcomers. And I'm not going to preach uh, uh, last week's message, but it basically talked about communicating with our Savior. What is one of the weakest 
parts of the church. Christians, lack of prayer. Lack of communicating to God. We cry out to God all the time. Most people's prayer life revolves around what we're not doing or what we're needing. And we are struggling with whatever. You see, the prayer is not mixed with faith. We say, well, I'm a believer. I believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross for me in Golgotha, and I believe that I, my sins are covered because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're standing on the truth of the Word of God right then and there. And then we go, oh, well, I don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, I don't know if, I don't even know if I'm saved or not. Where's faith? If, if your faith was strong enough to get you saved, then your faith is strong enough to keep you saved. Get that down in your spirit. Get it down in the marrow of your bones. You say, well, I, you know, I just doubt myself, Brother Mullen. I don't doubt God. I doubt myself. Well, join the club. There are millions, billions of people that doubt themselves. Well, God, Lord, you just don't know how I failed, uh, Brother Mullen. You just don't know. I, 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 I should have done this and I should have done that. Well, so what? Join the club. Your salvation experience was the first activation of faith in your heart and life. What you've got to do is you've got to maintain that faith. Quit listening to what the devil has to say. Quit letting him have your ear every day and say, Okay, well, what did I do wrong today, devil? How am I coming up short today, devil? Oh, please tell me, devil, I know I'm a failure. Just come on, feed me some more. Why do you want to take your faith and throw it out like it's nothing? You're as much as saying that what Christ did on that cross is not good enough to keep you saved. And we know you don't believe that. Because you've already put your faith in Him when you got saved. Well, I don't know if I am saved, Brother Moan. Let me ask you a question. If you're not saved... Why is it that the devil keeps telling you you're not saved? Don't you understand that if you were not saved, the devil would be so tickled with you. He would be so proud of you. And the last thing that he would want to tell you is that you're not saved. Because if he tells you you're saved, that might encourage you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If he's sitting there telling you you're not saved, it's because you are. Why do, how do you know that, Brother Marlin? Because I know what you put your faith in when you got saved. Christ died on the cross. Your faith is in that. Well, do you doubt that now? You doubt that, you know, I mean, there, there are people out there that can, you know, I believe you can lose your faith eventually. I believe you can apostatize. It's not, not going to happen over a couple of mistakes. It's not going to happen because your life has not turned out like you think it should have. You know what God told me when I told him I wasn't worthy to pastor? He let me wall in that pity for a while. A couple of years, actually. I'm praying one night. Lord, I messed up a call on my life. You know, you call me to preach, you know, and I, this, that, and the other's happened. I, you know, I can't preach. Nobody's going to want to, who's going to want to ordain, ordain me? And finally, one guy, I guess God gets, you know, I think he gets weary of us sometimes. He said, Michael, you were about 14, he, I don't know what, how old I was. So he tells me, I'm about 14 years old when I called you to preach. He said, do you not understand that I didn't know where you would be when you finally answered that call? He said, I'm God. I know everything. You're over here. I'm calling you. I knew every failure you'd have in the meantime. I knew every mess up. I knew every backward step that you would ever take. 
He said, but you know what? He said, I called you anyway. And he said, that call is not revocable. It's not, it is not uh, uh, going to be pulled back from you. It's not without repentance. It comes without repentance. Verse won't come to me. The call is without repentance, what I'm trying to say. He's not going to come over here and go, oh, I messed up, boy. I'll tell you what, I called him over here, but boy, he just didn't work out. When you got saved, you think God says, well, I don't know if he's going to work out or not, but we'll give him, a, we'll give him a, a, a try. We'll give him a test drive. Oh, there he did. He's messing up. Get rid of him. Don't work that way, folks. Once you make the application, once you uh, communicate, once you have that faith, the power is there. Yes. That power got me through all those years of, of uh, uh, messing up. Now, I'm not telling you that I was walking with God during that time. I was not. I probably should have died two or three times just over foolishness. God had his hand on that little 14-year-old boy. And he's guiding me. He's moving me. He's, he's keeping me. The Bible says that he can keep me until that day. And he knew exactly where I'd be and what I'd be doing when I finally said yes. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows exactly. He knows your every failure. Yes, he does. But hear this. As they say in the Navy, now hear this. He knows your every failure. He knows every mess up that you've ever made. He knows it better than you, actually. But he has never once thrown it in your face. You hear me? Not one time. He said, oh, you're too weak, you're too bad, you're too wrong, you're too tall, short, good-looking, too ugly, whatever. He's never done that. If you're a child of God, he's never going to throw that in your face. That's the devil talking to you. And you see, that's where faith gets off track. We all know who God is, and I don't think there's a person in this room, knowing everybody here tonight, I don't think there's a person in this room does not believe in the power of God. What we don't understand is that faith activates that power, puts action to that power, and gives you the ability to serve God. Without it, you'd be on your own. And when you listen to the devil, when you listen to that negative feed, that constant, absolute, constant barrage of lies and, and, and junk that the devil tells you, no wonder your faith is not strong. You know, Christians need to be able to discern the voice of the Lord. You don't have to discern the voice of the devil because if you know if it's not the Lord, you know who it is. And if there's constant feed of negativity coming into you, that is not God. God does not condemn. He convicts. And when he convicts, it's always with love. Only God could do that. Only God could, could tell you your wrongs and make you feel good about it. Not, not good about the wrongs, but good about what he's saying. Only he could do that. So it's all about the faith. Going into Romans chapter 4. I, I, I was going back over my notes again today and, and uh, I looked up promises and promise in the Bible. We're always talking about God promised me this and God promised me that. And I'm not saying God does not do that. There's not one verse of scripture in the Bible that talks about promises that are not already mentioned what the promises were in the Bible. I'll say that and you can do that with, as you please. A promise is a divine assurance. When God makes you a promise, it's a divine assurance. The bulk of the terminology of promises and promise in the Bible deals with Abraham. And what did he promise Abraham? 
justification by faith. Not the law. The law hadn't even come along yet. Abraham was pre-law. Pre okay? It wasn't about a bunch of set of rules and regulations. It wasn't about the Jewish law. It was about justification by faith. His faith, get this, his faith was his righteousness. Abraham was not perfect. David, bless his heart, not one of my favorite characters in all the Bible, Probably because I can identify with him. I'm about as big a failure as David was. Oh, but David slew the giant. Yeah, David did a, lot, did a lot of good things. David was a mess up. All you failures out there, David was a failure in a lot of instances. But God loved him anyway. Called him the apple of his eye. So whatever you are beating yourself up with, Whatever you're claiming that the devil wants to lay on your shoulders, get rid of it tonight. Know that faith in what he did on that cross. First John chapter 1, you know I talk about that verse of scripture all the time. It talks about confessing our sins to the Father and that he is faithful to forgive us. What does faithful mean? Does it mean that, well, you know, you're at number 491, so you're in trouble. No. He's faithful. God is faithful. This, this word. <laughs> this word. He's faithful to what it says. He's faithful to what he accomplished in you on the day of salvation. You're not the the stereotypical case study that you think you are. You're not the exception to God's rule that you think you are. And that's why you don't have faith in the church that it, like it should be. Is because we don't take these, this word and its promises and take it to the bank. Forgive that expression, but I like that expression, so... You can take it to the bank. You can cash it in. If this word says that it, it's so. And this word says you're a child of God. By faith you're a child of God. And that, that power that you need to maintain that child of God status is yours. It is not a fairy tale. It's not a myth. It's not make-believe. Romans 4, 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. We just talked about that. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. That's why, that's why the devil loves to be so legalistic why he loves to misuse the law. The law is not a bad thing in itself. If it hadn't been for the law, we wouldn't know what sin was. But it's the idea of putting our faith in keeping that law is where the problem is at. Okay? Verse 15, Because the law worketh wrath, but where there is no law, there's no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace Faith followed by grace. Well, I thought it was faith followed by power, Brother Marlon. What in the world do you think grace is? <laughs> grace is some powerful stuff. Grace is some powerful stuff. There ain't a person in here that's a born-again believer that's not covered by that grace. We're covered by that grace. Woo! Glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah! Where would I be without that power? Where would I be without that grace? I'll tell you where I'd be. I'd still be living in the world. Or I'd be listening to the devil telling me how sorry I was. By grace. 
For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where there is no faith, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith. What is of faith? Your justification. Your righteousness. When you stand before God on judgment day, he's not going to say, well, okay, I'm looking at your report card here, and I don't think we're going to be able to open the gates of heaven for you. No, if your faith has been maintained in who Christ is and what he did on that cross, he's not going to see your track record. You'll be judged on the things you do and don't do. That, that we'll, we'll be judged on that. But that doesn't have anything to do with your righteous standing before God. You're not standing there in your own righteousness. You're not standing there and going, hey, I'm the, I was the perfect Christian for X number of years. Here I stand before you, God. He'll look at me and he'll say, your righteousness is as filthy rag to me. He said, but your faith is in Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross. Therefore, you are righteous in my eyes. That's grace, folks. That's grace. That is grace. That's what we're under. You're not grace. And I say, I always have to add this because I know some, some denominations take this and run with it. When you start talking about grace, boy, they'll take it to the limit. Grace is not a license to sin. Know what it is. It's the power. And he goes on and said, Therefore, at verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Now, again, what's the promise? Justification by faith. Not only, not to that only which is of the law, but that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened, quickeneth the, the dead and calleth those which be not as though they were. Remember that verse of Scripture. That's basically a definition of faith. We know what Hebrews says about faith. He calleth those things which be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall they be the seed be. We know Abraham was given the promise of many nations. Israel right now is probably about 8 million Jews. And I don't know how many other Jews are in the world but they're not any big percentage of the 8 billion people on the planet. So did God lie to Abraham? No. We are heirs by what? By faith. We have been grafted in. It's the church that makes up these nations that was promised to Abraham. Jews, yes. Those who believe in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he did on that cross, they can be a Christian just like anybody else. But the promise was made to Abraham that the nations would be in this inheritance. And it is by faith that we are there, okay? So, this divine assurance, this promise, is, is irreparably connected to prayer. We've got to understand that your prayer life is more than just communicating to God what you need. It is your connection to that power through faith. Bible does it well. Let me read on down here. Verse 18, uh, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, you know the story of Abraham. You know that at a very old age, he and Sarah had a child. We all know that story. I don't think anybody here doesn't know that. He says, he staggered not at the promise. Mm. There are no boundaries outside the Word of God on your faith. The church is moping along, hobbling along, believing some things and not believing other things. When's the last time you believed for something hard? When's the last time that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, uh, you found your circumstances just absolutely insurmountable, but you knew what God was going to do and you knew by faith 
no matter what those circumstances said, by faith, God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And the last time you've been in that position, you will find yourself, as a believer, you will find yourself in that position many, many times. It does not take any faith if we all lived on Candy Street. And everything was given to us the moment we wanted it. You know, we live in an instant world, you know. I remember when instant coffee become popular. It was like people were just amazed that you could pour water on that and it'd come drinkable. <laughs> and whether it was drinkable or not was pretty questionable. But, but that was a big deal. Little did we know that that was just the toehold of what was coming. Now, you know, we get on our phone. If we, you know, we're calling somebody, come on, work, work. I mean, that signal's got to go all the way to the satellite and back, you know. But we're mad because it takes three seconds to link up to a phone number. We live in an instant world. But the devil wants to come. That's the reason the devil likes to, to put time limits on everything. Because he knows the longer it takes, that's the reason, he, you know, in the book of Daniel, Daniel prayed and it took 21 days for him to get his answer. And Daniel is about as stout a Christian as you'll find in the Bible. So if it took Daniel 21 days to get an answer to prayer, what are you complaining about? Are you Daniel? God will answer it in due time. The Bible tells us that he will exalt us in due time. There will be a time for your answered prayer. We've got to, to start believing in this power that works in conjunction with faith. We take it before the Lord. And I told you last week, you know, prayer is not about us telling God. It's not about us convincing God. And it certainly is not about us changing God's mind. And now you're going to, some of you will throw some Old uh, Testament scriptures at me. You have to go back and read that in context and see what they're really and truly talking about there. God's never made a mistake. There's, there's a different connotation to that. But anyway, I won't get into that right now. Your boundaries are limitless. Your prayers, by faith, can obtain the power to do whatever needs to be done. It, it's not for, we know that the power of God is not for show. We know that in this church. We've talked that many, many times. The power of God is for the kingdom of God and to accomplish God's will in the kingdom of God. And so we know that that power can do anything that God can do because the power is God. It's the Holy Spirit power. And it's our faith in that finished work. That's why James uh, 5.16 says, the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, what, what is the righteous man? Someone who is justified by faith. He's not righteous because he's the perfect Christian. He's righteous. That's you. That's what I want you to get on this. I'm talking about you. You're righteous. Oh, Brother Ma, you don't know what I did today. No, I don't. Don't need to. God knows, though. You don't lose your righteousness because you foul up. If that was the case, whew, the only people who would be making it to heaven would be the people who get, get righteous a split second before the rapture takes place. The rest of us are in big trouble. Think about that. You are righteous. Sister Jane, you're righteous. I didn't say you're perfect. I'm not perfect. But you are righteous and your prayers, that fervent prayer, that means something besides a, a, a Saturday night, uh, give me a whatever, Lord. I'm talking about some fervent prayer. I'm talking about that righteous person petitioning God and having faith during that petition. If you're praying and you're not having faith, maybe to the bottom of that chandelier, that thing's going to ricochet right back at you. People say, well, why don't we have more people healed in the church? They're getting healed all over the world. They're not getting healed in this country because we're too stinking lazy to have faith. There is no reason for us not to have enough faith to be healed. 
Well, Brother Martin, you broke your leg. I didn't see you walk around. No, I didn't. Had I had enough faith, I could have got up and walked up. I could have put that bone back in there by myself and walked off. I could have. I told you, I'm not perfect either. But I am righteous. I'm righteous by justification by faith, not by who I am or my pastoral bravado. My Christian bravado. We read the promises in this word. And then when it comes down to the nitty gritty, we go, well, I don't know. I don't know what God's going to do. Hmm. Says here. That's what he's going to do. He's going to do what this word says he's going to do. In Crossway Church, you know I love you so much. I pray for you consistently. We've got to start acting on our faith. I, I preached a sermon. I, you know, I kind of judge myself sometimes on sermon. I thought it was a a really great sermon, not because I preached it, because the Lord gave it to me. On the mindset, our mindset, what we set our minds on. Well, you need to set your minds on what Christ did on the cross. You set your mind on that, you see him on that cross. I'm talking to somebody earlier about addictions. I said, every time you're, a, you're tempted to that addiction, I said, go to the cross. See Jesus in your mind on that cross. That should, be a, that should tell us a myriad of things that we need to know. I'm saved. It tells me that. I'm righteous. It tells me that. All by what? By faith. And if I'm righteous by faith, then the power is mine. The power is yours. I challenge everybody here to begin to ask God. You know, the disciples ask God, said, increase our faith. Well, I don't know where we're at on the faith meter. I don't know where you're at on faith. I don't know where I'm at on the faith meter. But I know where I want to be. I want to be so full of faith that when I laugh at the devil, it'll be because I think he's funny. His attack is funny. We've got to begin to believe this gospel that we so desperately want you know, we want revival in this region. And it's coming. Ready or not, here it comes. Ready or not, here it comes. And I'm believing for it. And I need you believing for it. But I need you not only to believe in for that revival, I need you believing every promise in this Word of God. I need you to believe who you are in Christ Jesus. And when you pray, I need you to believe that God's going to do what you ask Him to do. As long as it's according to His will, He'll do whatever it is. He's not going to give you that 400-foot yacht unless it's his will, okay? And if he does give you that yacht, well, give me a call and I'll go riding with you. You know, we, we, we think foolish on things. That was a foolish statement, but you get my drift. Start praying for the kingdom of God. And I'm not talking about just for, for that. I'm talking about the kingdom of God to be manifest in your life. I could tell you why we don't have more people that are healed. Unbelief. We try to make it some complicated thing why so-and-so didn't get healed and why they didn't get their healing. 
answer's in the book. It's unbelief. We didn't get here because we didn't believe. Don't mean you're a bad Christian. Don't mean necessarily that, you know, you don't have any faith at all. And I can prove that to you by you thinking on this. If I ask one sister to pray for this brother, she can feel, she can believe for his healing, but she can't believe for her own. You believe for somebody else to be healed easier than you can believe for yourself. You know why that is? Because you don't see yourself as righteous enough. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. You, you know all the flaws. It's kind of like that mirror of the house. Up there shaving. That's kind of flip. I flipped that puppy across. Whoa! What is that? You know, my nose went from that to that. You can see the pores. You can see the hair. You can see it all. You see some stuff you don't really want to see. That's how we see ourselves spiritually. Because we know of our own failures. We know our thoughts. We know all the, the, the things that uh, 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 we don't particularly like about ourselves. And I'm not saying that these things are just okay with God in His sight. I'm just saying that if you have your faith in who he is and what he did on that cross, that justification by faith makes you righteous. It makes you holy. It makes you that child of God. And every promise in that word is yours. Every one of them. We need to stand on that. We need to grasp that. And we need to ask God, God, help me to think this through to the point that I can begin to act on my faith as if it's already done. We don't have faith, and probably we have a lot of times, oh Lord, just give me this. Probably have a lot of our faith is we wait on God to do something. I want, or I need, I have to have, this needs to happen, whatever it is, and then we just sit around waiting on God to do some bona fide miracle. And he does do miracles when it's his will. But are you acting on that faith? Or is your mindset going, this is going to happen? I'm telling you, revival is coming to this city and it's unprecedented. It's going to happen. Not because I'm going to make it happen, not because I'm anything special, not because of anything to do with me. I'll do my part. Hopefully you'll do your part. We got to believe for that and you got to start believing for your own life. Quit sitting around waiting on something to happen to, to strengthen your faith. That's not how faith is strengthened. Oh, when it does happen, it does strengthen your faith. But if that's all you ever do is sit around and have faith and wait on something to happen, you've never put any action to that faith. You've never done anything with that faith except sit there and hope. Act on it. What does that mean, Brother Man? That means to have the mindset that it's going to take place. Have the mindset that what you're believing for, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It changes our life. Faith persuades us that what we're believing for will take place. And we need persuading. We're believers. Everybody here is a believer tonight, I think. As far as I know. We're believers and we need our mind to be changed like the mind of Christ have that mindset. The Bible tells us almost 20 times to continue to stand. That's not talking about standing physically. Stand on your faith. Stand on your faith. It is your faith. Hebrews 11, 1, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You have to hold fast to the foundation who Jesus Christ did on that cross. 
We know by virtue, I, and I don't, again, I don't think I have to convince anybody in here, well, Christ died on the cross, everything we have comes back to what he did on the cross, right? So when we're having faith for that new job or that financial problem, that lost loved one, let your faith be encouraged by what Christ did on the cross. Let that persuade you. If nothing else will persuade you that it's going to take place, that should do it. Mm. The words 11, 1, uh, Hebrews 11, 1 are substance things hoped for. Substance is the essence, the assurance, the support. The word evidence means the proof. So our, that means that our faith is the assurance of the proof of what we believe. Say that again. Our faith is the assurance of the proof of what we believe. If this was a key piece of evidence in a homicide, then I would have an assurance that this piece of evidence was going to convict the perpetrator. Well, faith acts just like that, except it's not seen. I'm seeing that evidence with my faith. I'm seeing that evidence that, my, that what I'm believing for will take place. In crime scene investigation, you have to, you have to mark the evidence. You have, to, you have to document everything. And a good crime scene man documents everything. And that takes time. But faith doesn't just believe what it sees. If you see it, it's not faith. If you're believing for a pay raise and you've already got it, that, that ain't taking faith. If you're believing for that lost loved one but they got saved last year, that doesn't take any faith. We've got to begin to act on the faith that we have. And what that takes, and I'm, going to, I'm going to close here in a second. I, th I thought my, my message on mindset was just right on, and, and I was a little disappointed that, that maybe I'm the only one who thought that. But what, what faith needs or what faith is, it's, it's a posture, it's a position. My position on this proof. My position is that this proof will do the job. So your, your posture, your position on your faith on a given thing needs to be Governed by your position on faith in the first place. Just the idea of faith. Okay? Are you following me? Don't go to sleep on me now. You have a posture. You have a position. My, my faith is just I have faith. For what? Everything. Well, what do you mean you have faith for everything? Anything comes up. I got faith. That's my posture. That's my stance. That's my position. My position on this subject is I have faith. Well, Brother Malden, where's the evidence? My faith is the evidence. Right. Well, I don't see anything, Brother Malden. That's okay. If you see it, it's no longer faith. <laughs> Are you getting this? My position is to have faith. My position is to take the posture of faith. If you're playing football... And that 230-pound running back's coming at you. And he's got a full head of steam, and you're just standing there. You don't have time to meet him head on. You better take a posture. BJ, you played some football. And some of them old boys were about three times your size, wasn't they? You're going to block one of them dudes. You best get yourself set. You better take a posture. It ain't happened yet. The collision has not taken place yet. But if you're going to get into that collision, you most better have position, you most better have a posture of faith to know that when the devil comes at you head on, your posture is bring it on big boy. Yes, Glory to God. Yes, Woo. Yes, Hallelujah.
have faith. Take a posture of faith. A position. An attitude. You've heard of an attitude of gratitude. Well, have an attitude of faith. Most Christians are walking around with an attitude of unbelief. My goodness, we're children of God. Christ died on the cross. If he can make me righteous, he can most certainly answer my little prayer. If he can make me holy, he most certainly can do whatever it is that I'm asking him to do that is according to his will. I know that it's going to happen. How do I know it? Because he died on the cross and that gives me everything that I ever had and ever needed in my walk with the Lord. Get an attitude. I don't like people with attitudes, but I like people that got an attitude of faith. Start believing. Quit walking around in unbelief. I know I'm going over here a little bit, but just live with it. It's too important to stop now. Quit walking around in unbelief. You might say, Brother Bond, I try. This it's just so hard for me. Well, keep praying and asking for it. Have faith that she's going to answer your prayer to increase your faith. You see what I'm saying? He says he'll do it. I mean, if the disciples can ask for it, you can ask for it. An attitude of faith is an attitude of believing. Pastille. It's an attitude of trust. The problem is that too much of what we pray and ask for, we, we, we do without really considering our faith. We just ask for it because that's, we we're Christians and that's what Christians do. We pray. But all the time in the back of our mind, we're going, well, I don't know. You know see how it turns out. We forget about that power. That's that same power that made you righteous. That's the same power that's going to make you, that makes you holy. You've got a posture. You've got an attitude of faith. You're believing for whatever. And you're trusting God. And this is important. You're trusting God for do it His way. Too often when we begin to have faith for something, we get a little too detailed. How many times has God ever answered your prayer and did it exactly like you wanted him to do it? <laughs> come out of left field and blindside you. But there's your answer. There's your answer. You're believing for these schools. Who, who would have believed that that would have happened a year ago? Well, if it can happen in the schools, it can happen in jails. If it can happen in the jails, it can happen anywhere else. You're a child of God. And that faith is your persuasion that a certain thing is truth. That's all it is. Faith persuades your mind that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. See, faith is about not only who God is, but what he can do. Third thing is what he will do. I mean, God can move a mountain. It says so in the Word. But God's not going to move that mountain unless there's a purpose for it. God doesn't just, you know, sometimes he'll show out a little bit. Show his power. But if we really believe that he can move a mountain, why in the world can't we have an attitude of faith to believe whatever's going on in our own heart and life? Amen? Y'all come on up, Michael. I'm going to stop right there. I'm not, I'm not through with faith. I'm going to have to come back on this next week and, and, and do some more. I, we all need an infusion and an increase in our faith walk. I don't care if you're Billy Graham or, or some other big time. Everybody needs more faith than what we have. 
And it begins by us asking and having faith to have more faith. Now, that sounds kind of silly, but it's, it's really and truly what we need. Imagine, if you will, now you have the 12 disciples. They're walking around and their shadows are healing people. Goodness gracious. They're praying over cloths and people getting healed by that. They had faith. Well, Brother Marlon, they walk with Jesus. That's a little bit different. Well, yeah, it is a little bit different. But they didn't have the Bible either. The Bible was not written at that time. They had some Old Testament law. Well, I'm not Peter and I'm not Paul. And neither are you, Brother Marlon. Well, I'll go along with it. But that don't mean I can't ask for all the faith that this old body can handle. All the faith that I can muster and believe everything that word says. I've never doubted God. I have doubted myself, and that's where the devil gets involved. And I don't rehash that with you again. But don't let that doubt. You're still righteous. You're still righteous no matter how bad you messed up this week. Why? Because your faith in that. Same thing gets you saved. Same thing gets you healed. Same thing got saved. Same thing give you everything you need in Christ Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight. Hmm. Help us all here tonight, Lord God. Every person in this, the sound of my voice. Increase our faith to a level that we've never had before. If we're full of faith and, you know, sometimes we get a little proud about how much faith we have. Don't let us walk in pride, Lord God. But even if we've seen miracles and great things done, signs and wonders, Lord God, it's still about faith. We can still have room for more. My shadow's never healed anyone, Lord God, but I would be thrilled if it did, if I was full of enough faith I'm not asking for that, Lord God. I'm just wanting my faith to be increased. I want every person here, faith to be increased to a whole new level, a whole new walk with God. A whole new way of thinking, a whole new attitude of faith. Persuade our minds that these things are true in your will, Lord God, in all things. I'm going to open this altar up to you tonight. If you need prayer for anything tonight, just come and I'll be glad to pray with you. And you come, bring your faith with you. Well, I'm having...